study. We are trying to dial in right now to the correct station. We'll be there shortly, I think. <laughs> Dennis is back there working furiously for us, so I'm sure we'll get that rectified shortly. Uh, happy Thursday. What a wonderful time we have that we can gather together, uh, that we might uh, find respite and comfort in the company of one another and the company of fellow Christians. It is sometimes nice to get away from the happenings of the day today and to be able to slow down here to talk about the things which are truly important. You know, as often as I work and the things that I do throughout the day, uh, those things pale in comparison to the work that we do toward our salvation, the work that we do in the Lord's kingdom, pales in comparison to those things. So it's good to be here with you doing the things which matter. We've chosen a good thing this evening. Uh, but better still than just being here, let us study and make application of the things that we will study. It was uh, posed as a recommendation that we would study the book of Proverbs by Sister Rena. So I said, okay, let's get together something on the, uh, the book of Proverbs. So we're not going to go through the entire book of Proverbs because that would take us a long time. Uh, we're going to pull out one thing from the book of Proverbs, and that is better things in the book of Proverbs. There's only one other book in the entirety of the Scripture that comes close to the saturation, in other words, the number of times that you hear the word better, uh, to Proverbs, and that's Hebrews. And per, per chapter, per book, you know, all those things when we look at it, Proverbs actually uses that word more frequently than any other book in the entirety of the Scripture. So, uh, the book of Proverbs is widely considered the book of wisdom uh, in the Old Testament. Romans 15.4, put down here at the top, and it's weird reading what you write, but here, I'm read it anyway. Romans 15.4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. The Proverbs were delivered for our learning and our guidance. The word better appears 23 times in this book. We'll not do every one of them. Uh, but when God calls something better, I want you to read that. When God calls something better, it is worthy of our attention. Don't you think? When God calls something good, it's worthy of our attention. There are times where the Bible may repeat something, and I'll say unto you again. Those are special times to kind of perk our ears up a little bit and pay, pay attention to those things. As we progress through this study, I want you to pay attention to what God considers better. Don't pay attention to what I consider better. We'll not pay attention through this study to what the world would consider better. All right? I'm sure there's a lot of things the world would consider a better use of our time than being here. I disagree. So let's focus on what the Lord has to say about being better. And if you want to know the gist of what the book of Proverbs is about, you really just open it up, start chapter 1. And you just read the first few verses. So, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, what for? To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you want to know what the book of Proverbs is for, that's what it's for. It's worthy of our study, and it's worthy of our time, and especially worthy of our application. So the book of Proverbs was written for us to gain the knowledge it's full of practical applications for almost any situation. If you have anything going on in your life, there is likely somewhere you can find something on it in the book of Proverbs if you're looking for advice. And by design, it is given by God that we would grow an understanding of better things. That's the purpose. So we get into the discussion. Some better things in the book of Proverbs, is better in the book of Proverbs, are wisdom and understanding. 
I always ask people to define wisdom. What what'd you get for wisdom? Good judgment is part of wisdom. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of the what I had written down was pretty much what we had just read out of the first six verses. That it, it, sometimes we want to jump to verse seven. Yeah, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, uh, and there's its counterpart later on in the book. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so sometimes we just want to kind of throw in, oh, it's it's the fear of the Lord, right? And that's it. Hmm. Solomon hmm. gets more specific there at the beginning of the book. It includes righteousness, which is, I mean, it's pretty broad. It includes justice. It includes equity. Uh, it includes it, it guidance. It includes, I mean, we got a lot of synonyms for wisdom as well, prudence, mm-hmm. knowledge, discretion. But that kind of gives us an outline of what wisdom looks like. It has to include those things. And so if our system of wisdom doesn't include questions about Righteousness, you know, morality, right standing before God, it's not wisdom. If it doesn't include matters of justice, you know, how people are to be treated, uh, and along with equity, you know, fair treatment, then it's not wisdom. Yeah, it's we're not exercising wisdom in those circumstances. Yeah. So, I asked that question because sometimes people confuse wisdom for intelligence, mm-hmm. right? They, can see, they, they think that wisdom and being smart are the same things. And that's, that's not true, right? Smart is just uh, maybe, for instance, you just have a lot of knowledge. You can regurgitate a lot of information, those things. You just know things. Wisdom is something totally different according to the scriptures, right? It's having experience. It's knowledge. It's good judgment, right? Understanding the precepts of the Lord. Making application of those things. You have to be wise enough to make application of the things that you know. Otherwise, you don't have wisdom. You just have uh, intelligence, right? I just I can quote all these things, but I don't make practice of it. I don't understand it. It's not a part of my life. Then I am not wise, right? We got one and then two. Well, we always used to say that you have to have knowledge, and you have to have wisdom with the knowledge because you have to know how to use the knowledge that you have. Mm-hmm. And the understanding comes from the experience you have by using wisdom with the knowledge. Yeah. And that all three of those go together as one. And you have to have all three in order to uh, be, you know, what God wants us to be. Because he tells us, like you say, repeatedly. Yeah. Wisdom is the sum of those parts. Yeah. Right. All of those things are what make up wisdom. Right? Yeah, to illustrate the difference between intelligence and wisdom, my, my favorite illustration is intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it on a fruit salad. There you go. Huh? There you go. All right, I like that. I wouldn't. I do love tomatoes, too. So you also touched on one word, Wayne. I don't know if you're foreshadowing here, but maybe we'll give you a shot at it. Define understanding. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive words of understanding. Is wisdom the same thing as understanding? It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Yeah, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of understanding. Right? But what does that mean? So boil it down for me, right? So we're telling me kind of what it is. Tell me, tell me what, what you, break it down a little bit more. Let's get to the root of it. What does understanding mean? You know, that makes sense, but man, I don't understand it, you know? You'll say that, or you'll say something like, you know, I have what it takes, you know, I, I have knowledge. I have knowledge of one plus one equals two. I have knowledge of division. I have knowledge of uh, mathematics. I have knowledge of science and names of stars and things, but I don't understand. I can't wrap my brain around the concept the concept of this or that or the other thing. 
it's a little too much for me to grasp. Yeah. There's a little bit more to just having knowledge and just having wisdom. It's 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 an extension of what both of those. It's kind of like you have to have knowledge in order to have wisdom. You have to have wisdom in order to have understanding. Mm. So, so I'll give you an example, right? Does, I mean, if we look out here and I ask, probably most of you have one of these. Yeah. Right? Most of you know how to work it. Do you understand how it works? Uh, probably not, right? We're lucky that we have a, a very few select smart people that understand how it works. We may know how to work it, but we don't understand how this thing works. Right? So you may know what righteousness is. Do you understand how to practice it? Do you understand what righteousness looks like when exercised? Mm -hmm. That's understanding. So it doesn't do us any good to just know the things. We have to be able to exercise them, to understand how to produce those things, to know how they work. Right? That's how we understand really what wisdom is. So the, the scripture tells us in Proverbs 3, 13 and 14, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. You see how the scriptures separate those two things. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. You know, at that time, silver and fine gold would have been you know, nowadays, if you want silver, I mean, yes, I could, I could order you a thousand pounds of silver right now. Yeah, I may just get on my little iPad and type in my account number, and it'll be at my door tomorrow morning. You know, I could do the same thing with gold, except I couldn't probably afford to buy it. Uh, but at this time, these were scarce commodities, near impossible to get a hold. Only a very select few would have had them, right? Especially not in any sort of abundance, right? Maybe. You might find a way to have maybe a little bit, right? But not, not a great amount of it. But when you see the contrast, I want you to look at how God is contrasting these two things. What he thinks is better, wisdom and understanding, versus what maybe the world might find as better. Things. Material things. Things that look shiny. Shiny. Things that otherwise seem valuable, right? If I went to somebody and I said, hey, listen, I could give you this giant brick of gold or I could teach you a little nugget of wisdom, which one do you think they're going to pick? They're not going to take me too long to get rid of my gold, is it? Right? But what God says is better is the knowledge and the understanding. Because knowledge and understanding can lead me to Him. It can lead me to salvation. It can lead me to teaching someone else about those things, right? It can lead me to raising up my household well. I can do a lot of things with knowledge and wisdom. But is fine silver or fine gold or any of those things going to get me into heaven? Are any of those things going to get anybody I know into heaven? You see, God's not taking bribes. Those things... Don't have it. See, so do, you, do you see where Proverbs is drawing this contrast? It's not comparing wisdom and understanding to fine gold and silver because they are not comparable. It's comparing how God sees things versus how the world sees things. So, do you see how Proverbs is already starting off on a kind of a different way to read those things? We really have to dive in deep to get a good understanding of that. The wisdom that knows about God and salvation is to be compared to nothing that is earthly. Because there is no comparison of value. For wisdom is better than rubies and all of the things that may be desired. Have you ever desired some things? You know, if you really sat down and thought about it, you could probably desire some pretty fine things. I heard that uh, fellow, was his name? Jeff Bezos? Heard about him? He just spent $300 million on a yacht. Can you imagine spending three hundred million dollars on a boat? I mean, you—if you thought about it, and you've got to do what? Yeah. If you—if you've got it, you can dream up some pretty big things, can't you? 
Now, if I said I could give you anything you desire, by today's standards, was the first thing that popped in your mind be rubies? Let's see, even if you were worldly, probably it probably wouldn't make your top ten. You know? But the scriptures tell us that wisdom is better than those things. And yet, even further than that, better than all things that can be desired. Not most, not, not some. All. And are not to be compared to it. So you hear what I said earlier when I was saying in the previous passage when we're talking about knowledge and wisdom and understanding and those things? Silver and gold? There isn't a comparison. God is just using those things because it's things that we understand. It's things that the world would understand as valuable. doesn't mean that there's actually a comparison to be made there because the value of those things is not comparable. It'd be like a Bugatti Veyron to like a Pinto. You know what I mean? They're just, it's not the same thing. They both got four wheels and a stupid. It's not, we're not talking about the same beast here. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? I'll ask you before we finish. What do you think? How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? Wisdom in the exercise therein. So I, I do this, if, if I'd have done this study, and maybe our demographic inside here was maybe a little bit different. I have at least one young person in the crowd. I'm not saying you're not, but we'll just say you are. Okay, whatever, leave that up to you. So you ask the question, right? And it's rhetorical. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? So when I talk to younger people, I ask this question. Take a look around you where would you find wisdom where you're sitting right now? Okay, that's one place to look. But I want you to take a look. See, you listen to what I'm saying. I want you to take a look around you. Where would you find wisdom if you wanted to know? Listen to your elders. Listen to those. Part of wisdom is experience and seeing those things seeing how they make application. You know, I would rather listen to someone who can tell me how not to fall into a ditch than fall into one 15 times and then finally figure out how to stop falling into that ditch. You know, one of the things the younger folks can do, myself included, is start to inquire to their elders. Inquire and listen. Seek wisdom. They've had time to see the application the fruits of its labor. You know, we, we can kind of, you know, as younger folk, we can kind of try to get an idea of what that might look like. But an idea of what it might look like does not replace 65 or 75 or 85 years of practical wisdom and experience. Those things are not the same. So, talking to myself here too, it's good to inquire and talk and listen. Rena. You can. You can. Yes. Yeah, he held up his he held up his Bible. I said that's a good place to look. But I want to what we have got what what I think people could do better in, uh, and I speak from experience here, because it, what was it Mark was it Mark Twain had a a saying, it's 
you know, it's like, what is it? The older I get, the more I realize how much smarter my dad's getting. Or is, the older I get, the smarter my parents get. Or something. It's a quote, something to that effect, right? But the idea is that when you're young, you kind of think you know it all. You've got to figure it figured out. You'll read through it. I know what this passage means. Moving right on. You know what I mean? Whereas you might seek the experience of an older Christian or a wiser Christian. Tell me not only what this means, but tell me how it applies to life. Give me your wisdom. Right? There's a reason why we have women who are supposed to teach the younger women. Why we have older men are supposed to teach the younger men. Because there is wisdom and experience there. You know, it's, it's not just talking to the young folks. You know, sometimes we get 40 or 50 or 60, and we think we've still learned everything we can learn. You know? Or older. I'm not going any farther. I'm not trying to make anybody feel some type of way. I'm just, you know? <laughs> just, you know? It, older changes as you get older, right? When you were 12, old was 20. You know? Now I'm 40, and old, believe me, has, the needle has moved because I don't want it to apply to myself personally, but uh, nonetheless. Do you know, and here's the thing, yeah. somebody said that about you once. What? <laughs> I said, you know, I'm sure somebody said that about you once. They I'm sure it was said about me. They yeah, they're probably still saying it about me. Okay. Yeah. But there is certainly something to be said for uh, leveraging the family of God and leveraging the people that are around you for all types of things. And wisdom and age do not walk hand in hand. There are some who have experienced lots of things that there are people who are twice their age couldn't imagine going through or living. So we don't necessarily have to boil down wisdom to age, right? But being willing to ask the question and listen to the answer. That shows a great deal of wisdom as well. The Bible will talk about and, and, and instruct us to heed the counsel, as it said here in Proverbs, heeding the counsel of the wise. Right? So, to get understanding is also better uh, to be chosen than silver. Man, if we, we all learn that at, a, at a, the younger age, sometimes people would be a little, a little better off. I asked, is this a rhetorical statement? What do you think? So it's when you ask a question that the answer is obvious or already known. So what do you think? Do you think when he asks that question, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? Do you think somebody is looking for a quantifiable answer? Uh, it's uh, 3.37 times better to get uh, wisdom than gold. Uh, you know, what do you think? A lot better. It should be apparent. Yes. The, the answer should be there for you. You see, what it is, is it's a value-based question. The Scripture is prompting you to assign value to those two things. Right? What are, how do you value the counsel of God and the wise versus how much do you value things? Even things that are worth, in worldly terms, a lot of money, or they have great worth. It seems like when you get older, things don't have the same value anymore. Yeah. Different things have value. Different things. Yeah. Different things we change what value means to us. Now it's family. So, you know, when you was young, maybe your value were different, but when you start to get older or you become a parent or a grandparent, your value of what, they, or what things you value can change significantly. You know, if you want to change your life, have a kid. <laughs> you know, or the, you know, or there's a lot of ways to understand those things. 
But what the scripture is trying to prompt us to do is to see and come to the realization that the wise understand the value of wisdom and its worth. That's what it's prompting us to do. See, it's already setting the stage for us. I want you to understand the value of wisdom and be wise enough to know it. So I said, why would wisdom and understanding be important to you? I'm glad we talk about it. And that's great. I love talking about the things. Okay, so best famous words. Okay, so what? It's always a good question to ask yourself. You know, you're asking yourself at the end of a sermon, okay, so what? One of two things happened. Either you didn't listen or they didn't spell it out. Okay, so what? Now what? What do you think? This question is not rhetorical. So you can better serve God than serve your fellow neighbor? Yeah. Do you think you have to have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of righteousness to be able to serve your neighbor and your fellow brethren in the manner that God has prescribed? Right? Not by worldly standards, but by spiritual standards. That would be one reason why you would need to know wisdom. How could you do a thing that you are not aware of, right? You don't understand it. You know, how can you win a race you didn't get into? Huh. Uh, the answer that I have down for that, why is wisdom and understanding important to you? Uh, because wisdom is an expression of the character of God. And part of the reason why we're here is to imitate God and have uh, some of his character about us. It's like Proverbs 3.19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. Mm -hmm. Or chapter 8, verse 22, get to it here. Uh, there we go. Uh, this, it was the personification of wisdom is speaking. Uh, she says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. So we want to be wise because God is wise, and it's a good thing to be wise. Yes. Some of the things I wrote down I'll share with you. Maybe you like them, maybe you don't. It's what applies to me, though. So, Wisdom and understanding help me to discern the word of the Lord better. Isn't that one of our responsibilities, is to be able to discern the Word? You know, you could spend the entire, what this means or what that means, or carrying on about this, that, or the other, but the Bible warns us about those things, right? It says, don't get caught up in silly conversations, right? You should be talking about things that matter, things with substance, so when I have wisdom and understanding, I can better discern the Word of God. I can better teach others. You know, that's one of my responsibilities as a Christian, is to be a teacher. If I don't have wisdom, if I don't know what it is, and I don't have understanding, I don't know how it works, how in the world am I going to teach someone? wouldn't be a very fruitful lesson, I can tell you that. One of the things wisdom and understanding helps me with is empathy. I learn to relate with people. I learn to understand how they feel and be patient in those things when I deal with them. You know, part of that is wisdom. Safety. It keeps me and my family safe. Not always from all physical harm, it can, right? You, know, you can use the expression of how dads teach different than moms. It's like mom will tell you a thousand times the stove is hot, dad will let you touch it once. <laughs> right? You know, part of me being able to keep my family safe is to use the things that I have learned, my experiences and wisdom and understanding, to prevent them from making the same mistakes that I made. To prevent them from having things befall them. To understand that when they've missed one service, and then two services. I've seen this before. This two will turn into four, and then I'll never see them again. Right? I can use that 
use my wisdom and understanding to do those things for the safety of myself and for the safety of others. You see the value of wisdom and understanding? You could have wrote anything in there. Right? Not so many things that gold does, does it? Just kind of sits there until somebody else wants it. Doesn't really have any value unless somebody wants to buy it, does it? Otherwise, you just got a hunk of metal. You've got nothing. But wisdom, it's different. Just like the scriptures, it's living, it's organic, it does things, it acts. So better in the book of Proverbs is wisdom and understanding. How far do we go tonight? We go to the quarter till, or yeah, quarter till. Okay, we got enough time to get into some of the, the things here. For better, in the, we have any other comments or questions before we move on. So we were talking about money, and that's that was, uh, what you were saying is uh, like James five, where it's like, "Come now, be rich, weep and howl for the miseries that will, are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you." Because they've made up treasures in the last days. Mm -hmm. It's like those treasures, rather than seeking God, and in fact, I think that was like what was happening was like these Christians were like, well, we're going to go and we have business plans, and James is like, well, you, you, you better say, you know, the Lord wills. Yeah. Because uh, it'd be better for you to, you know, be with your fellow Christian, help your fellow Christian, and gain wisdom. Yeah, I'd rather I'd rather go into to heaven poor and starving than go into hell fat and full. I can tell you that. We do well to recognize our priorities and where we should be focused and the value of the things that really have value. Right? And I'm not saying you don't need money. I'm not saying you don't need food. You know, people understand these things. That's kind of part of exercising wisdom here, right? Is to be able to discern the things that we understand that these things, they do have some value. But when compared to the things that really have value, they have no value, right? I will have the faith that if I am willing to do the things that the Lord asks me to do, He will provide those other things for me. And if He chooses to provide me less, then I will be abased. If he provides me with more, I will be overfilled. But I am at his mercy as far as those things go. But what I will refuse to not gain in is my knowledge and wisdom and understanding of his word. That's what James is warning those people about. You've got to know what's important. You have to know what really has value. You know, and it's not cars or houses or even having a really good time. You know, have fun. Do those things. But not at the expense of your spiritual uh, salvation. Did you have a comment, Caleb? I was, I was going to say, we want to tie what you were saying uh, even further, what we've already been talking about. Read the next couple of verses after what you've just read about withholding the wages. If you've got it open, go and read it out loud. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, verse yeah, verse four. So it's like, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. That's in yeah. chapter 5, by the way, in case anybody was wondering yeah, the reference. So what he's saying there is, you know, how have these guys gotten so rich? You know, why do they have all this gold and silver? Because they're cheating their workers. <laughs> they're not being just to them or equitable to yeah. them. And it goes right back to what we were saying a minute ago out of Proverbs 1, that wisdom includes justice and equity. equity. Right? These guys are... I mean, you know, if, if you're a fool in one way, it, it tends to blossom out into every way. Uh, these guys have valued their gold and silver so much that they've completely lost sight of what is right and just. Yeah. 
and it doesn't have to be gold and silver. Yeah. Man, oh man, we can be taken away by a whole lot of things. It doesn't, doesn't have to be gold or silver. So, better in the book of Proverbs is to be loving. I mean, we'd think that's obvious. All right. Well, what do you mean by love? So I think it's important to define words, don't you? You should know what you're talking about if you're going to be the thing. So 27 verse 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. I ask, explain the proverb and make an application. What do you think that means? Open rebuke is better than secret love. It's important to show people. Yeah. Think about this. Open rebuke. Yeah. Open rebuke yeah. is better than secret love. Yeah. Well, what is rebuking? Maybe if we define what a rebuke is. Yeah. Correcting a person. So, openly correcting someone, which most people think is not a good thing. Right? I disagree. The Bible says that's fine. That's okay describes and defines how we should do that, but it's okay. It's better than secret love. Correction is more loving, better than trying to save a person's feelings. You ever thought about that? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll re I really want to talk about it. I don't want to hurt their feelings. You know, I don't want to upset them. You ever had that? I've said that a time or two. Mm -hmm. You should have a warning about thinking that way. I would rather be openly corrected than you conceal your love for me and let me go into hell. Because I continued on doing that which was not good for me. I like that. It says, chapter 9, verse 7, start there, verse 7. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abused, and who he who reproves, reproves, reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Mm -hmm. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser still. Teach a righteous man, he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, as she said, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So that, it, that's, yeah. that comes together with all that. Yeah. You ever, you ever try to correct a fool? Man. I mean, good luck. You know, I will tell you that at one time, the person who stands before you could by any means be considered a fool. And because someone was willing to reprove me and to teach me, I was able to learn. I started off a fool. I don't yet count myself to be a wise man, but I can tell you I'm no longer a fool. So you may incur a negative response by trying to correct someone who is a fool. Okay. But should that deter you from doing it? Remember, I don't want to correct you because I don't want to hurt your feelings. You don't want to disrupt this relationship that you and I have together. You don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to cause any ripples. So I don't say anything. The Bible tells us it's better to correct that person. That's love. That's better than allowing them to be comfortably going to hell. Sometimes love incurs knowing who correct. That's, that's, it takes wisdom. Wisdom is knowing who to correct. I think a lot of times we try to correct people and we just waste our words because it's just a waste, it's a waste of time because they're not listening to anything we got to say. We can say it, but you know already it's not going to work 
you know, you've done that before, it's already good, it's not going to work. So, you know, it, it, having a little wisdom there uh, makes a difference there because that way you stay out of a fight, you stay out of a hospital, you know. What I would encourage us to do, okay, this is just my, th my two cents on it for whatever it's worth, I'm not going to tell you how to run your railroad, okay, is correct them anyway. Okay. We are not responsible for the increase. Our job is to plant and to water. A no today does not mean no tomorrow. We might be planting the seed in that person's heart, and you know what? If I tell you about Jesus, and I tell you how He loves you, and I tell you how to be saved, and you curse me all day long, and you throw things at me, and you smear my name, fine. I'll take it all day. If that's the minimum that I have to suffer for the chance that you might repent, sign me up. That's fine. I'll take it. When we see examples in the New Testament of those who went to preach in the early church, and I'm sure we have examples of this throughout even history since, they went in knowing that in many cases they would not be well received. And even in some cases knew their life would be taken. So there are times when we still, even if they're a fool, hey, take a little time. You never know who that fool will turn into. You might see in 10 years, you run back into that fool on the street, and now they've got their life together. So read Proverbs 3.12 and make a connection to this. We've got enough time just to do that. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father, the son, in whom he delights. What I put down for that is helping to correct harmful behavior is pleasing for all parties, including to God. He corrects the one whom he loves because he doesn't want to see them hurt themselves. And sometimes it's you're on the outside looking in, and it's easy for you to see how destructive that behavior is. But for a person on, who is on the inside looking out, you know, sometimes they have no idea. It's just a, a long, dark tunnel with no light at the end of it. You know, while well, we're out here in the sunshine. Just an example to, I guess, to drive this in. You know, we, we probably know this proverb best from the Hebrew writer quoting it in Hebrews. And he's quoting it because the people he's talking to are on the verge of falling away. Mm -hmm. And he is correcting them. Yeah. because and, and this is where the value comes in. The, the correction saves people from error and saves them from the consequences of error. And in some cases, like the, the people that Hebrews is written to, that's, that's error that will take you to hell. Yeah. Because they are thinking about falling away from Christ. Yeah. So the Lord chastens those whom he loves. And it tells us that no chastening seems pleasurable for the moment. But it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Right? And I never, I never liked getting a whooping, and I'm sure you probably never did either. Right? But it produced righteousness in the long run. You know, I, I'm not going to be one of those people, well, today, you know, kids today, I don't, get in, I don't get involved in all that. Kids was bad today, bad yesterday, bad 10 years ago, bad 100 years ago, bad all, rotten all the way through sometimes. Okay? And there were good ones along the way too. So I'm not going to talk about today. Okay? The Bible warns me about doing that kind of business and I won't engage in it. But kids could um, benefit sometimes from a little bit more discipline, a little bit more chastening. And with that being said, so also could we. Sometimes when we are corrected as a child, we see how they respond, and they don't understand those things, and it's not good for them. Sometimes as adults, it's not easy for us to accept correction either. But it produces wisdom. It makes you wise. So if you are corrected, count it a blessing that somebody in the first place loved you enough to tell you 
and in the second place was able to give you the wisdom you needed to make such corrections. So, better is it to be loving, according to the book of Proverbs. We'll pick up letter D. I'll make a mark in there for Sunday. Uh, appreciate it. It's been a good study. I appreciate all the comments and, and those things. Uh, certainly, classes are not as much fun when people are not as engaged. So, <laughs> I've been there. Uh, we'll have someone leading us in a song here in just a moment. I think I have the invitation after that.